Welcome back. As you know, the Governing Council of the ECB has decided to conduct a thorough review of its monetary policy strategy. And we consider this forum, this year in particular, as one way to understand your thoughts in relation to this review, in a way as one of our listening events. The review is currently ongoing and scheduled to conclude in the second half of next year. Yesterday we had a panel that focused on some aspects uh, of monetary policy, inflation objective, central bank communication, and today in this panel we will be discussing monetary policy instruments and financial stability. So it is my particular pleasure to welcome the next chair and moderator of the panel, Isabel Schnabel, member of the executive board of the ECB. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thierry. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the panel on monetary policy instruments and financial stability. This panel will complement yesterday's panel by focusing on another set of topics that feature prominently in our monetary policy strategy review. The discussion will focus on two broad topics. First, the effectiveness and side effects of conventional and non-conventional monetary policy instruments. And second, the role that financial stability considerations may play in monetary policy. In response to falling natural interest rates and policy rates approaching the effective lower bound, all major central banks, including the ECB, have expanded their monetary policy toolkits. While it is widely acknowledged that these non-conventional measures have been successful in stimulating aggregate demand and putting upward pressure on prices, it is also feared that they may, may give rise to side effects and that these side effects may increase over time. These concerns are all the more important in the face of persistently low inflation and the underlying structural forces which make it unlikely that these measures will be discontinued anytime soon, so that non-conventional tools have actually become quite conventional by now. In light of this, it is important to reflect on the experience with these instruments. One important question is whether the effectiveness as well as the balance of costs and benefits depend on the level of interest rates and on the state of the economy. One prominent side effect relates to financial stability. Through portfolio rebalancing, unconventional instruments intentionally induce higher risk taking, which supports inflation, but may also give rise to financial instability if risk taking is excessive and if asset price valuations become detached from fundamentals. So one key issue is whether financial stability considerations should guide and inform monetary policy decisions and how these considerations could be incorporated in central banks' monetary policy frameworks. Another question refer refers to the division of labor between monetary policy and micro and macro prudential policies. We have three excellent speakers on this panel who will provide different perspectives on these issues. Let me introduce our first panelist, who is Lucrezia Reichlin, professor at the London Business School, who will talk about the role of conventional and non-conventional monetary policy tools and their relationship with financial stability. The panel is scheduled for one hour. Each panelist will have 10 minutes for the introductory remarks, and the remaining time will be allocated to the general discussion. Please remember that you will have to raise your virtual hand if you would like to ask a question, and you may, of course, already do so during the presentations. Lucrezia, welcome to the panel. The floor is yours. Isabel, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me to contribute to this panel. Monetary policy and financial stability, this is a very old topic, uh, but as everybody has pointed out, uh, we are now in a new world. This is new in the economic context, uh, as we have seen in this discussion, uh, low uh, equilibrium interest rate, new risk, including, including climate, legacy debt. But it's also new in theory, in the way in which we understand transmission mechanisms. We are not in the world of the Modigliani-Miller anymore. 
And it is new in practice uh, because, uh, as Isabel has just reminded us, uh, we have now new tools. Central banks have new tools. So they have large balance sheets, uh, which they are used proactively. And there is no oh, way back. I mean, at least, uh, you know, it is not likely that we will be in the old world, old world anytime soon. So the question is, uh, what is the relationship between monetary uh, policy and financial stability in this new world? What has changed? So um, I would say as a matter of introduction that uh, if I had to think about the long run, my answer would be very similar to what uh, I would have given you maybe 20 years ago. Oh, price stability should be consistent with financial stability. It's kind of the bedrock. But it is a necessary but not sufficient condition. So there is role for regulatory policy. So ma monetary and macroprudential policy should be natural complement. I mean, this is a truism in a way, uh, but of course it's not without problems. And we have heard some skepticism already in the discussion earlier on. In the short run, I guess that the complementarities uh, between monetary policy and especially unconventional monetary policy and, uh, um, and financial stability are probably greater than pre-crisis conventional wisdom uh, would have foreseen. In the middle run, in the transition, is this is where the challenges emerge. Uh, monetary policy support for financial markets may morph into dependence. Uh, there could be effects on leverage, uh, and so on and so forth. So, in order to uh, you know uh, uh, address this discussion, let me uh, uh, distinguish between two type of policy with a certain abuse of language. I will call. Uh, I will talk about passive and conventional monetary policies, passive in the sense that the, uh, the balance sheet of the central banks increases endogenously as a result of this policy. I will summarize them as the market making function of the central bank. The central bank intervenes to support financial intermediation. It becomes a sort of intermediary of last resort. And I would say that this policy should be complement uh, to conventional interest rate policy. Uh, in general, uh, this uh, policy should be supportive uh, of financial stability since uh, they support market functioning and uh, therefore they should both, uh, support financial stability. There are plenty of examples uh, in the history of the last 12 years uh, from the early response uh, of the ECB in the liquidity market, but also uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the money market, but also you know, some aspect, for example, of the PEP package uh, uh, fall in this category. I would call active and conventional monetary policy uh, QE and associated policies. Uh, these policies are actually uh, aimed at reducing returns on safe assets, pushing investors further along the risk and the maturity spectra. And they are uh, understood to be substitute for conventional monetary policy. When the interest rate uh, um, reach the effective lower bound, uh, this is where this balance sheet policy, you know, take, uh, you know, kick in. And here is where maybe the trade-offs uh, that everybody is worrying ab about with, with financial stability uh, are more important. Um, so let me say that to understand these trade-offs, uh, uh, we have to understand that active policy may consist in a complementary use of different tools, aim at controlling the entire yield curve. So we should not think of the terms of just one interest rate, but uh, you know, of the entire yield curve. Now, in the euro area, we know that uh, what the ECB itself has called the package, uh, which has put, toge put together you know, by the end of 2014, the beginning of, of 2015, consisting in negative interest rate, uh, asset purchases, TLTRO, and forward guidance. So, so indeed, is a complementary use of all these different tools. And then you know, there are new tools now or design uh, uh, to face uh, the pandemic. Yeah. So given this complexity, of course, uh, the interaction between macro and financial risk uh, uh, is also complex uh, and is, is hard to understand in simple models. Now, in order to give a very stylized discussion of that, uh, let me uh, uh, point out that there are two effects that we should worry about. One effect is the redistribution of risk from banks to central banks, governments, and several, et cetera. The other effect is the total supply of risk in the economy. 
both matter for monetary policy and financial stability. Um, now, um, let me stress, uh, uh, let me just give you an example, I mean, to, to, uh, to illustrate what I'm talking about. If the central bank uh, buys risky asset uh, uh, and the supply of risk does not adjust, uh, then in equilibrium, uh, agents uh, have to hold the same amount of asset uh, as before, minus what the central bank holds. Intermediary, therefore, becomes less risky but the total amount of risk in the economy is unchanged, is just redistributed. So only if there is a larger supply of risk in the system, there is an increase in the risk in the economy. In other words, the total amount of risk in the economy changes only if the supply responds. And this is exactly what the central bank is trying to do, to induce, to, to induce this supply response. So because this is what supports uh, the macroeconomic stability. And, uh, uh, but of course, there could be bad outcomes. One outcome, it, outcome, bad outcome, is that uh, if policy is unsuccessful. Okay, so if QE, you know, because of um, millions of reasons, uh, you know, especially you know the the risk aversion which is uh, which prevails in the economy is unlike you know is ineffective in increasing the amount of risk. The second uh, bad outcome it could be that, that the risk that QE or, or other policy is inducing. Uh, would create incentives uh, to get uh, to uh, in, you know to to for bad risk. So I mean, if we have to think then of a of uh, you know a balance of policy and the conditions of success, I think that there are three relevant questions. The first question is macroeconomic effective. You know the bedrock. Okay, so nothing is in the long run without uh, you know price stability, and macroeconomic stability. We're not going to get uh, financial stability. And uh, um, so the question is, are the uh, active policy effective in influencing inflation expectation by pushing investors along the risk spectrum? And here, there are two conditions. Uh, uh, one uh, is coherence uh, with other policy, including fiscal policy. Okay, there is a big discussion there. But the second thing that I want to emphasize uh, is uh, the coherence of these packages of non-standard policy. So, and here, I mean, I want to refer to something that Klaus uh, Adam uh, said earlier on. Empirical evidence tells us that the effect of this policy are quite large uh, in the bond market, affecting spreads. But the effect on, on the, the evidence on how effective they are on macro policies uh, is less obvious, okay? It is less robust, although if you get a meta, meta, meta studies uh, of what it is around. And, uh, you know, then what is the conjecture? My conjecture is that the effectiveness of this policy really depends on the coherence of the package, on the transparency and stability of the framework. And this is obviously challenging because uh, we are not living anymore in a simple tailor rule type of policy. And I would like to give you an example here which is the example of the period between 2012 and 2014, in which it could be argued that delaying QE and getting only some components of this package, follower guidance and negative interest rate, provided a lack of clarity for the market that was very costly in terms of inflation expectations. Here you could see uh, the five-year uh, 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 five uh, inflation index swaps uh, for the US and the Euro area. And you can see that this, uh, uh, although there is a global component, no doubt, that there is uh, actually a, a, a decoupling in that period between inflation expectation in the US and the Euro area. And that this decoupling is something that uh, has been persisted ever since. Um, so this is the first. Uh, um, so this is the first. Uh, was the first question. So effectiveness. So what about the second question? The second question is: uh, Can the bad risk taking be handled with regulatory tools? So do we have another instrument? And well, in principle, yes. Okay. So we have this regulatory. So we have macroprudential uh, policies and so on. Of course, uh, this is something that uh, uh, we have to learn how to use, and there is a, a lot of scope for more learning. But also, you know, we have to be careful because macroprudential policy also have fiscal implications, and so we are talking uh, about a very complex uh, policy mix. 
The third question is about redistribution. I claim that there are redistribution risks, so which uh, implies that this policy involves assuming risk on the balance sheet of the central bank. And the question, therefore, is how can we manage this risk? Uh, and here I have just have two uh, um, observations to, to offer. So one is that uh, provisioning is import, important to cover credit risk in the central bank's balance sheets. So we have here to uh, you know, reflect about the central bank capital and the rules that, uh, you know, about uh, you know, cent central bank capitalization, the rules about redistribution of seniorage. All this discussion is relevant here. It should be relevant uh, for the strategy review. And the second uh, is, of course, governance. How do we design a governance that goes beyond uh, these Chinese walls which was uh, which inspired the governance that we design, uh, you know, in the old world. So let me uh, just finish with one slide. Uh, um, am I suggesting that we go back to old-fashioned central banking in the world of the fifties of uh, the Radcliffe report uh, or whatever? Um, well, not quite. I think that uh, as uh, my example uh, on 2012 and 2014 uh, suggests, I think that we need to retain the key insight of inflation targeting, which is the key role uh, uh, for commitment to a nominal anchor and expectation management. But this has to be done within a framework that uh, relies on several tools and therefore is complex. And second, recognizes the new reality and the need for effectiveness for, and for stability of the interactions uh, with financial, fiscal policy, and of course, regulatory policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucrezia, for these interesting considerations. We will now switch to our second speaker, who is Yun Song Shin, economic advisor and head of research at the Bank for International Settlements. And he will consider the stabilizing role of banks and central banks in times of market disturbance. Yun, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Isabel. It's a great pleasure to join you on this panel. Um, I'd like to start with a couple of observations um, from the uh, stress period in March, and in particular, the dash for cash, um, just to shed some light on um, the discussions that Marcus will um, uh, we'll uh, put on the table later. This is a chart from the Federal Reserve's uh, financial stability report that came out earlier in the week. And I draw your attention to the red circle part, which is the, um, the very sharp increase in, uh, in deposits um, among the short-term funding instruments in the US. And uh, this is an illustration of the dash for cash where uh, the uh, there was, um, if you like, a surge uh, of demand for, for money. And I think that illustrates uh, very much the, the role of the commercial bank, um, the role of the commercial bank sector uh, as the first line of defense um, as an elastic node in the financial system, um, which can accommodate the, the increase in the demand for money through money creation. And here's an example. We have a commercial bank on the left and a borrower on the right. And the commercial bank grants the borrower uh, an overdraft, which is to uh, write up some deposits. And then on the other side of the balance sheet is, of course, the loan, uh, because the overdraft is a loan to the borrower as well. Uh, and so this very elastic balance sheet uh, is able to accommodate the, uh, the increase in the demand for money. And um, what I would point out is that uh, uh, what this shows is um, the contrast between the elasticity of a commercial bank uh, from uh, the, the rigid stable coin or a money market fund structure where uh, the, the size of the balance sheet is purely passively managed from the, um, uh, from the flows uh, that the borrower provides. And we see here uh, the weekly data uh, from the US where we see uh, the the increase in uh, commercial bank deposits uh, starting from the first week of March. And uh, the red dots here are the corresponding increase in the commercial and industrial loans uh, that correspond to the counterpart, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the credit line counterpart to the, to the overdrafts. 
And Isabel, as you well know from our project on the Bank of Amsterdam, uh, this kind of um, liquidity creation uh, in order to, to meet a liquidity stress period um, is not a new phenomenon. And uh, in 1763, during the very sharp crisis that we wrote about, uh, here's an example where the balance sheet of the Bank of Amsterdam surges, uh, where um, it engages in, in market operations. It actually buys silver and gold coins uh, by creating money, by actually accrediting the accounts of the sellers of those coins. And it's a very early example of, uh, of an asset purchase program, uh, much like a modern central bank. Now, um, the... Elasticity of the, um, uh, if you like, elastic nodes also are important in the international context. And let me motivate it. Uh, let me motivate this point with this chart, which comes from our statistical release uh, from our banking statistics. What we saw in the first quarter was a surge in the cross border uh, in the cross border positions of the banking sector, and that's highly unusual. Um, what we would normally expect is that during a stress period, we would expect to see a contraction of cross-border uh, positions. But we saw this surge, and in particular, I would uh, uh, draw attention to the pink and the blue part, which have to do with uh, the interbank positions. Now, what might be going on? Well, um, if you think about the, the way that a swap line, the central bank swap line operates, uh, that chart really makes eminent sense. and. Uh, um, in this chart, what we've done, uh, and this is uh, a chart that's uh, from a forthcoming BIS bulletin, the left-hand box is uh, the United States, the right-hand box is the euro area, and in the left-hand box, we have the Federal Reserve and uh, commercial banks, and on the right-hand side, we have the ECB and other euro area headquartered banks. Um, I will draw your attention to the, to the color code here. So um, the, the Fed, uh, bo uh, lends uh, dollars to the to the ECB. So that's the green box in the top left-hand corner matches the green box on the top right-hand corner. The ECB, in turn, then provides those dollars to the uh, euro area headquartered banks. So the blue box corresponds to the blue box that's below. And crucially, um, what we're measuring is the gray, the two gray boxes. So the EU headquartered bank then sends the, the dollar funds back to either its, um, its related office in the United States or to its correspondent bank, which then, uh, deposits, it, which, which then deposits the funds at the Fed. So we have the, the reserves being sh uh, shown in this uh, pink color here. Uh, so what this shows is this, uh, this circular flow of dollars that comes from the role of the uh, of the Federal Reserve as the elastic node um, in, the, in the global financial system. And it turns out that the blue and the pink bars, which correspond to this uh, red arrow here, uh, matches the amount of the drawn uh, swap lines. Now, the reason um, I, I point this out is uh, not only to point out the, the importance of the international um, nature of the, of the elastic nodes, but also um, highlight uh, you know one issue which is very important that which is uh, the currency dimension so why is it the dollar uh, why not other currencies and um, I think this does raise the question of how um, uh, non-conventional monetary policies uh, your balance sheet policies uh, might be able to be deployed in other contexts and uh, in, uh, in particular there's been a very interesting debate about how far we can take asset purchase programs in the emerging market context and uh, if we look at this chart, which shows the, um, the cumulative flows um, into emerging market government bond funds, where we distinguish the foreign currency funds in pink and the domestic currency funds in blue, what we've seen is that although the uh, outflows we saw in the dollar and other foreign currency funds have largely been reversed, the same is not true in the blue. In other words, for the domestic currency uh, bond funds, we have not seen a reversal, um, which raises the question, which currencies receive the flight to safety flows? 
Now, uh, because of the nature of the crisis, fiscal policy has been a very important uh, dimension of the uh, of the policy response to the uh, to the pandemic. Uh, and yet, emerging markets have been much more reticent in fully opening the monetary floodgates. And although some central banks have engaged in asset purchase programs, they've been very small. Uh, they've been more directed towards uh, market functioning rather than um, uh, QE as such. And I think one hypothesis is that uh, the reason for this uh, is that emerging markets have uh, still memories of the period of monetary instability that they went through in the 1980s and the 1990s. And one thing that we know is that during periods when you have a very sharp depreciation, uh, exchange rate pass through to inflation also goes up. Um, so these two charts uh, show you the, the, the pass through um, from exchange rate depreciation to inflation. And uh, they, were, uh, they tend to be very high when uh, you have a period of monetary instability. What's interesting is that, that you also see that even in the Asian context, uh, pass through um, jumps in 97 during the Asian financial crisis. And it, it does, I think, um, uh, it does highlight the importance of the monetary fiscal interactions, where if you have less um, mature financial markets that can absorb the issuance of government bonds, uh, then the fiscal expenditure will show up in terms of uh, uh, narrow money uh, through monetary financing. And if you like, the fork in the road is um, the, the monetary policy response. So if the uh, if the very sharp depreciation in your currency leads to an exchange rate pass-through uh, that is much higher, uh, whether that uh, turns into a period of very high inflation, sustained very high inflation, or it's just a transitory uh, spike, depends very much on the subsequent monetary policy response. And uh, uh, when we do an inflation at risk type exercise, where we run quantile uh, regressions to see uh, the various um, uh, quantiles of the of the distribution of inflation one uh, one year ahead, we do see that uh, if you shift the fiscal deficit by one standard deviation upwards, um, you do have this rightward shift in the inflation density. So let me conclude as well, and uh, I, I think uh, Marcus will will be able to lay out uh, uh, some of these points in a more systematic way. So the first point is that the dash for cash underscores the importance of elastic nodes that can accommodate the demand for money. Um, and here the, the issue is uh, it's also about the currency as well as about money as such. Um, the, the dash for cash tends to gravitate towards certain currencies rather than just money in general. For example, in the money market fund stress, we saw much more stress in the dollar money market funds than we did for the euro money market funds. The other point is that commercial banks are the first line of defense, and uh, therefore it's another reason for having uh, uh, a great emphasis on having a very strong commercial bank sector. And the banks, as I said, can accommodate the demand for money through overdrafts, and it's very unlike stable coins or prime money market funds in that, uh, in that respect. Clearly, central banks are the second line of defense both domestically and internationally, and, uh, and we have, uh, again, seen the very important role of central banks uh, during the recent uh, stress period. However, not all currencies are created equal. And uh, we know that currency crises can unmoor uh, inflation expectations, and uh, uh, depreciation then passes through to inflation. And uh, the fork in the road, of course, is that the eventual outcome uh, depend very much on the monetary policy response. So let me conclude there, Isabel. For reminding us that uh, emerging markets are actually in a very different situation uh, from us. I think that was extremely useful. Let me also remind the participants that uh, you may already now start raising your virtual hands. We are very much looking forward to your questions. And let me now hand over to our final panelist, who is Markus Bonamayer professor at Princeton University, who will present his considerations on how to transform the monetary analysis into what he calls a trap analysis in order to safeguard monetary transmission, central bank independence, and financial stability. Markus, the floor is yours. 
Thanks a lot, uh, Isabel. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you and with this panel, this prominent panel here at, uh, EC at the ECP Forum 2020, virtually in Sintra. So I would like to talk about some challenges uh, we might face down the road, and this is very important also for the new monetary policy framework the ECP is thinking about. One, of course, is, as everybody knows, we will have very high public debt levels and also private debt levels. We might have a wave of corporate defaults, and there are also new digital monies coming in. And the emphasis I would like to spend on this 10 minutes today is very much on traps. You know, the central banks have to look out to make, not to be caught in traps, to maintain its independence and flexibility down the road. And there's a narrow corridor between two traps. One is the deflation trap, and we have heard a lot already in the previous talks about it, the zero lower bound or effective lower bound, reversal rate, you cannot cut the interest rate. Uncertainty might go up, people do more savings for precautionary reasons, there might be flight to safety, as Hyun was pointing out, and all of this will lead actually for more demand for money holdings and safe asset holdings. And that might actually push down inflation and we might get down to deflation and essentially hurting borrowers significantly. That's one way we can be trapped. The second trap, of course, is an inflation trap. And inflation is acting a little bit more like a bank run. If the anchor breaks, then you know there will be a run on consumption or there can be a run in other safe assets. That's this flight for safety aspect. So you can run in foreign currency, for example, as Hyun was pointing out. And that you know, leads to an import cost push shock. And that you know, leads to another inflation spike then. So that's not around the corner, but you know, one has to keep this in mind all the time. And finally, there might be all of a sudden wage pressure coming up as well, you know, along the Phillips curve arguments, uh, which you know, is fairly flat and we haven't seen much action there also in Japan. The Phillips curve is very, very flat. But in general, the big danger essentially is because of the high public debt level, there might be some solvency concerns, and this might inhibit the monetary policy to do the appropriate measures to control inflation because it might undermine uh, fiscal stability and financial stability. And I will talk later about you know, how fiscal dominance might play a role in the, such circumstances and how financial dominance might play a role because the financial sector might not be able to handle uh, the appropriate monetary policy. So that's what actually one has to keep in mind. And one way to deal with that, to keep these traps in mind is to really focus the second pillar of the ECB's policy strategy on these traps. On top of the monetary analysis, really focus on these tail risks of being trapped or tripped. So why, do, why is it useful to have a second pillar on this on top of the economic analysis? It's very useful to typically have some cross check, uh, have some robustness analysis, because not everybody's, everything should be relying on a single model, on a single theory on the mainstream. So it's actually good to have some heterogeneous thinking to avoid some groupthink. And there's some important earlier work by Alan Blinder on this groupthink aspect within central banks. And it's a little bit like a, a risk a chief risk officer, where you also would like to have somebody looking out for the tail risks. And that's, I think, what could be part of the second pillar or could be included in the second pillar. So the second pillar should include some the effectiveness of the transmission mechanism, financial stability considerations, but also the fiscal spillovers and how it affects uh, the independence of the central bank. And on top of it, of course, there will be, and I don't have time today to talk more about all the digital money aspects central bank digital currencies, that's also some considerations to make sure that the monetary sovereignty is guarded and preserved for the ECB. So that's essentially uh, one message I would like to get across. And then I would like to focus on one particular tail risk, which I call the inflation whipsaw. And that's also part of the, the trap analysis. So again, uh, what's inflation whipsaw? Right now, we actually have a lot of deflationary pressure. So inflation is very, very low. So we have uh, essentially close to zero or negative inflation. And as I mentioned earlier, we have not so much room because the reversal interest rate is kicking in. So if we cut interest rates further, it might be counterproductive. It might hurt the financial sector. And the transmission mechanism is not working the way it should be. But it might be down the road, later on, because of this high public debt level, we might have some inflationary. I'm not arguing this will happen. I'm just saying that's a tail risk one has to keep in mind. And that's because of fiscal dominance and financial dominance uh, considerations. And what I would like to say, what are the different inflation and deflationary pressures 
are coming in. So there's various pressures which are currently very active. So right now it's very hard to spend. Uh, you know, you can't go to restaurants, you can't do this. There's a lot of forced saving. There's a lot of uncertainty in the economy. When there's uncertainty, people want to save more for precautionary reasons. That leads to deflationary pressure. So that's a minus sign here. Of course, there's a lot of capital misallocation going on. We have to reallocate a lot of physical capital. At this stage, uh, we don't know. So the capital misallocation leads to less output. It's a supply shock that's inflationary. There might be redistribution. You can show that redistribution uh, from one sector to another sector is inflationary, hence reduces all the deflationary pressures we're facing at the moment. There might be government commitment problems. There's pent up demand. So right now you're forced savings and later on, let on people will catch up to it. Of course, you can't go more often to restaurants down the road, but there might be certain products, you have some pent up demand. And there are many other aspects I can't really go into, uh, which you know have different, it's interesting to see the different forces pushing uh, at the stage. And right now we have a lot of forces, very, very powerful, pushing for low inflation or even deflation. But it's not clear that this will remain all the time. And the argument is there's a tail risk. And what you would like to have, you would like to have a ability to be very forceful now and also be very forceful later on. So you can essentially also use later on breaks. So if you have uh, independent monetary policy, a very powerful central bank, well endowed with uh, capital, then you can be actually much more forceful at the moment. And the ECB is very forceful to put the accelerators on because you're sure later on, if you were to need brakes, you can also impose the brakes. So it's a little bit like a race car depicted here. If you have a car with good brakes, it's also, you can also drive much faster and get closer to the edge uh, right now because you know later on, if you have to brake, before the curve or wherever it comes, uh, then actually uh, you can break. So that's essentially the analogy. So what are the breaks? The breaks is the central bank independence. There's a lot of argument, especially in the US, that we don't need central bank independence. I would argue it's even more important to have central bank independence because you know it can be more aggressive now because if you were to need it, you have it there and you can avoid the fiscal dominance which might come down the road. You can, it's very important to have very prudential regulation to avoid the financial dominance. And both of these are very important elements. So let me go to fiscal dominance before I go into financial dominance. So fiscal dominance essentially is that there are two authorities, the governments, the fiscal authorities, and the monetary authorities, the central bank. And they typically play a game of chicken. So there's like two cars running against a driving against them. The question is who will chicken out, who will swivel, and they will lose. And it's the fiscal dominance typically is the inability or unwillingness of the fiscal authorities to control the long run expenditure GDP ratio. And that limits the authority to raise uh, uh, interest rates if it were uh, needed later on. Also because certain member countries might have financial difficulties uh, financing the budget or there might be default risk on the government bonds. So what's really important is to include uh, is like a risk management approach and instead of looking at debt to GDP ratios primarily, I think one should have some value at risk analysis, which focuses at the fiscal debt servicing cost. So the debt to GDP ratio is actually not so prominent because right now the interest rates are very low. So we really should focus shift away from the level of debt divided by, by flow GDP. Let's focus from flow to flow. So some debt, debt servicing costs, so the fiscal servicing costs. Uh, given the fiscal capacity, and the fiscal capacity can be very different. So there are certain countries who can hike up tax rates further, others cannot. So in the US has much more fiscal space by in allowing additional taxes compared to other countries who have uh, less fiscal space on that. So, but in, in general, I would like to shift away from the debt level, but more the fiscal debt servicing cost, but they can of course spike if there's a financial crisis. And that's why the emphasis on the value at risk rather than uh, just purely on, on a level of things. And that resonates also with what Grecia said, which said very much focusing on the risk perspective rather than on a level perspective. And that's essentially comes very close the flight to safety, uh, there's a loss for the safe asset status of certain government debt. Of course, the ECB can protect the safe asset status of certain government bonds. But there's, of course, always a danger you lose. And that should be part of the risk management analysis, uh, the risk management approach. And whether you lose your flight, whether you use your safe asset status depends very much 
relative to other safe assets. So if, for example, Japan and US expand a lot at the government debt level, but then Europe has more room to expand as well. So the analysis should incorporate also what other big safe asset providers are doing. So that's on the fiscal dominance side. But the, the, the big policy implication is that you want to strengthen the independence. And the way you strengthen independence is enshrined in the, in the your international treaty. So that's very, very strong, much stronger than for the Fed, for the ECB. But you also have to have enough equity. So the ECB should have enough equity. So it might make sense to expand on the ECB's equity position, even if you know the ECB, of course, can go negative in the equity positions if it were to be necessary, but it doesn't hurt to expand, have a solid equity position as well in order to be really truly independent. You don't have to ask for recapitalization when you know you want to do something the fiscal side doesn't is not agreeing with uh, on the interest rate policy. The second thing is now financial dominance. So I move now from fiscal dominance to financial dominance. Of course, we have monetary dominance, then everything is fine. The ECB doesn't have to worry about it. But there's also financial dominance. And the financial dominance, and that was a Hun was uh, alluding to, is the inability or unwillingness of the financial sector to absorb losses. So with the financial crisis, there will be some bankruptcy waves. There will be some hit on the financial sector, and there will be some losses. And the question is, where, how to distribute these losses, and can the financial sector absorb these losses? So you would like to have a financial sector which really is strong enough, um, resilient enough, to absorb uh, these losses. So macroprudential regulation plays a very, very important role in this context. But essentially, if it really needs to be that there has to be some recapitalization, it can be done in two ways, either through the fiscal side or through the monetary side again, by moving the interest rates, changing relative asset prices to recapitalize essentially the financial sector. And as, again, there's a second form of game of chicken between fiscal and monetary authority, who is actually carrying the burden to recapitalize the financial sector. And to prepare for this, I think it would be interesting and the policy implication for that, for the assets purchase program is to really make sure that currently the financial sector and also the corporate sector is not levering up much more. So right now we don't want to have incentives for the corporate sector and the financial sector to lever up further. We would like to have a situation when you buy corporate bonds, uh, let's say from the ECB, that you have a preferential treatment if you have lower dividends or you have increased equity. So what happens to a large extent also in the United States that you have this huge corporate bond issuance and at the same time, companies use this revenue from the corporate bonds issues to buy back their own equity, which means levering up because the ECB or the, because of the central bank is providing cheap debt financing. So you don't want to actually uh, uh, subsidize higher leverage. You want to say we only buy bonds from companies and banks who have not uh, increased the dividend payment, or you know, ideally who have lowered the dividend payment and have increased the equity position. So there should be an incentive baked in in the asset purchase program as well, knowing that down the road, it might be a problem potentially. Let me come back more to a holistic strategy. So, so far our monetary strategy in the textbooks is primarily we have an interest rate rule which is a function of excess inflation and output gap, a la some Taylor rule, uh, very traditional. And then we have a makeup strategies, QE, various asset purchase program. I think we need a much more systematic approach to that, where we have you know, the interest rate, we have the price on risk, the term spreads, the balance sheet quantities, and how much the balance sheet quantities grow. These are all uh, instruments we would like to use as a function of the excess inflation relative to expected inflation, that's as a function of the output gap, but also as a function of the fiscal side, the value at risk of the fiscal debt servicing cost, as I mentioned earlier, and also on the financial risk. And as Lucrezia pointed out, how the risk is distributed in the economy matters a lot, and the central bank can actually affect the risk distribution. So overall, you would like to have a dynamic risk management approach where you have a risk transfer and a wealth transfer to reduce the endogenous risk. Well, what's endogenous risk? It's risk which is self-generated. Think of a bank run. That if you have a purely liquidity bank run, there's risk suddenly coming out of nowhere. This type of risk you can actually eliminate by having a clever policy and also lower risk premium. So you focus on risk premium as well, where the risk premium is the price of risk times the exogenous risk plus the endogenous risk and the price of risk is also part of your instrument tool as well. So with this, let me conclude 
on, uh, on these introductory remarks. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Markus. That was a very fascinating uh, presentation. I, uh, I have many questions, but uh, of course, I would like to uh, give the audience uh, the opportunity to ask questions. So please, if you would like to ask a question, raise your virtual hand so that we uh, can give you the floor. And um, uh, I see uh, that uh, Beatrice Veda Di Mauro from the Graduate Institute Geneva and INSEAD has asked the floor. So Beatrice, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Isabel. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, even a bigger pleasure to listen to all these presentations, uh, which have covered so much space. And uh, I want to add one easy question uh, to, uh, the, uh, to all panelists. And that's the question that a lot of people are asking in uh, the Euro area, in particular in countries like Germany, when they hear about potential financial stability risks um, stemming from monetary policy, they think about low interest rates, ultra low interest rates, which are very unpopular. They are convinced they will lead to asset price bubbles, to housing price increases, which are not sustainable, and eventually also to banking crisis. And on all of these issues, uh, we as economists and uh, as central bankers, um, do tend to uh, say, respond in part with the problem of the natural interest rate, which is very low, and with uh, a lot of other concepts that are not necessarily very easy to understand for the general public. So my question and challenge uh, to all of you is, how do you get out of this communication trap, to add another trap to uh, Marcus's ones? How can we... Uh, communicate uh, the necessity of uh, uh, QE and other policies, even though they may have some side effects. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bea. Of course, that's a question that I also find very interesting. We have uh, two further um, uh, questions in the queue, but at the moment I cannot see the names. Okay, so maybe we, we give the floor uh, to the panelists first and then I wait for the other two questions. So uh, whoever wants to respond, please come in. I would like to, um, yeah, can I, can I talk? Yes, yeah. yes, of course, please. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm, um, two observations, one on Bea's questions. I'm, I mean, I'm glad that um, she raised that question because I mean, one of the points uh, that I try to stress uh, is that uh, we are not uh, in a monetary policy framework anymore in which we can rely on a simple rule, like uh, you know, a tailor rule, a very much central of all, the old framework of inflation targeting. And therefore, communication is very important. And this is where things can go wrong. I think that uh, the complementarity of the tools uh, is a very important message to give. Now, how to deal with the German audience, I don't know, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think the more, you know, in, uh, you know, kind of up in abstract, I think this is, uh, should be, uh, you know, something to reflect on, okay? So what uh, happens to the, the old communication strategy when you have a multi-tools type of, uh, you know, uh, monetary policy? On second thing, I would like to get this opportunity on Marcus, because uh, um, I think we, we said, many things that goes in the same direction. We need to have a risk management approach. And, uh, you know, this has implication for both, uh, you know, fiscal policy, regular, regulatory policies, and so on and so forth. And I am very much sympathized with that, uh, you know, and uh, I've been saying that for a long time. The problem is, uh, uh, you know, is the monetary pillar really that tool? And uh, I mean, in principle, I mean, it's nice that we had it. So we can say, okay, so we had this cross-checking idea, which is a good idea, but we really have to put much more content in it because uh, the everything, all these frictions and this uh, instability that we have seen in, you know, in the course of the last 15 years, they really have very little to do with M3. And, uh, you know, and, and so I think it's, 
it's high time that the ECB says, great. I mean, we, we reinterpret the monetary pillar, but uh, in a very, very different way. And so there should not be room for complacency in saying, oh, well, we have the monetary pillar, so we are fine in our risk management approach. Thank you. So may I actually um, collect the two other questions before uh, the other two also have the, the opportunity to respond. So uh, we first have Harald Ulich from the University of Chicago, and then we have Paul de Grauwe from the London School of Economics. So Harald, please. Yeah, thank you. And a fascinating panel, lots of uh, interesting ideas. My question is perhaps mostly to Marcus, but also really to all three panelists. There used to be a time when, uh, when we thought about, mon about monetary policy as not being able to do all that much. You know, we came to a consensus, I think, in the mid-90s that monetary policy was mainly geared to keeping inflation stable, and that's, that's really what they ought to do, and the Maastricht Treaty was very much written in that spirit. I'm a little worried that if we go to you know, risk management, risk distribution, holistic approaches, you know, all kinds of aspects, um, that 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 we are that that we will give the impression that the central bank is really capable of doing a lot more than it may be capable of. Well, either you know maybe the central banks are indeed capable of doing a lot more, and the consensus shifted again. So that's one possibility, or we end up uh, uh, promising too much in the end, and that could be danger. That sort of comment may be in line with what Beatrice already had pointed out. Thank you very much, uh, Harald. So uh, the next question is from uh, Paul de Graufe, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed uh, these presentations very much. And, and my question is for, for Marcus. Um, and again, I, I liked the presentation, it was very insightful. But I was surprised by um, his re recommendation of raising um, equity of, of capital of, of the central bank, of the European Central Bank. Uh, I, I was really surprised about this because we live in a fiat money system, right? And we all know that central banks in such a system don't need equity. They can live with any uh, level of equity, right? Uh, also, it does, what does recapitalization mean? It, it really means that the, the government dumped bonds on the balance sheet of the central bank so that it can raise it's equity level, but this is just a bookkeeping operation without any implication, right? No fiscal implication whatsoever because the, the interest rates that the uh, uh, Treasury pays out to uh, the, the central bank are given back to, to the Treasury. So it, it has no economic meaning. It's just a bookkeeping operation. So I was surprised that uh, this seems to, to matter in, in uh, Marcus' analysis. Um, to, co to conclude, I think in a fiat money system, the only source of credibility of the central bank is its ability to maintain price stability, right? No. And this has absolutely nothing to do with what it has on its balance sheet. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Paul. Now I would like to give uh, to the panelists uh, again. So please uh, try to be concise be because we have another uh, question uh, coming up. Um, uh, but now, I don't know, maybe Marcus wants to start because he was addressed several times. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the nice questions. So I agree with you. Communication is very, very challenging. I think what's very important is to get a perspective in bubbles when the interest rate is very low, in particular, if the interest rate is lower than the growth rate of the economy, it opens up a lot of possibilities also on the government fiscal side, but it also makes bubbles much more likely and bubbles might be good to some extent, but they're also prone to be bursting and that creates a lot of stability risk. And that's uh, something one has to keep into mind um, in the communication. I don't have an easy way to communicate that. Uh, I think we have to, as an economic profession, probably all work together to make it clearer to the public and educate uh, the public more on this dimension. With regard to Lucrezia's uh, point about the monetary pillar, I, I totally agree with her too, that uh, the monetary pillar should be enriched and should include what I call the strap analysis, I think it's very important to avoid groupthink, to have two uh, different entities within the same uh, house to cross-check each other, get different perspectives, and also look at the tail risks, look at the particular, you know, what happens in, when you're potentially trapped and uh, focus on that. And 
that's also relating to Harald's uh, point. So I totally agree. The primary objective and the clear mandate is for the ECB to have focus on inflation and price stability. And uh, I don't want to go away from this at all. But if you don't look ahead on potential traps, you might end up in a situation where you get up, get into deflation or inflation because you didn't incorporate all the different elements. So I don't want to communicate to the public that uh, you know, there is, we will do all of this, so the ECB is doing all of these aspects. I just want to be saying, okay, be sure that you don't have to worry about this. We have taken care of all the different traps which can, might happen. And because our analysis in-house will take care of that. So that's essentially a different focus because you can have a flight to safety suddenly, you know, there's big shifts in the exchange rate or something like this, as Yun pointed out, and that leads to some cost push shocks or whatever, wherever the inflation or the deflation forces are coming from. Finally, uh, with regard to Paul on recapitalizing the, the ECB, uh, it is indeed the case that the central bank can have negative uh, equity. There's no problem on that, but it can only go negative to a certain degree. I mean, there's very important work by Bob Hall and your colleague Ricardo Reis from the LSE who show how far negative it can go. If it goes below this threshold, uh, then it is the case, actually, then the credibility of the central bank is undermined, and then uh, it's harder to manage and satisfy your mandate on price stability. So there is a limit, so you can go negative, but it's not totally disconnected, even in a setting with fiat money. So that's a thing to keep in mind. And on top of it, there's all, in addition, there's some headline risk. So if it, you know the German newspapers or any newspapers say, oh, you know, the ECB has no negative capital, that's additional headline risk even though you know, in the real world they can go negative, and we have many central banks which went negative in Chile or Czech Republic, or many central banks went in negative territory, but there's a limit how negative it can go. Thank you very much, Markus. Um, maybe uh, you and Lucrezia can be very quick, because I would like to have the, uh, uh, the other question that has come in. Yun, please. Perhaps just to, um, Isabel, perhaps just to pick up on the last question that, uh, that, that Paul gave us. Um, uh, Yes, it's true that uh, central banks can operate with uh, with negative accounting equity. Uh, ultimately, um, it's the trust in the money which uh, which uh, you know sustains the credibility of the central bank. Uh, the question is how negative can the equity go uh, before that trust is eroded? And um, uh, you know, we put out the working paper again uh, on the Bank of Amsterdam, Isabel, uh, which is a historical example of. Uh, what happens if you push, um, you know, beyond the line of uh, no return? Um, um, yeah, let me just start, stop there, and then we can we can entertain some more, uh, some more questions. Thank you very much, Yun. So the great thing about the Bank of Amsterdam is that you can apply it for many things, including also stable coins, as you, as you also did. Um, Absolutely. So, <laughs> Lucrezia, please. Yeah, I mean, I would say to Paul that the credibility of central bank. Uh, lie on the shoulders of the fiscal authority, okay? And so even if technically we can have negative uh, uh, capital, uh, I think that there is a limit uh, and, uh, and, you know, and this is uh, also linked to how we want to, you know, communication and so on. And, uh, you know, they, also the way in which central banks redistribute seniorage differs. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, you know, I, we should have a look at that and, uh, you know, especially in the euro system to, you know, to, to have some principles. Uh, now to Harold, I think that, uh, mm, I think these are very serious concerns, uh, but, you know, if, if, you know, sitting now is the second day of this conference, uh, everybody talked about complementarities, uh, interaction between fiscal and monetary policy, interaction with this and that. So clearly, we have discovered new channels of transmissions because of this non-neutrality you know, non mechanism, frictions, and so on. So monetary policy, in a way, is more powerful. But on the other way, uh, you know, it is also, you know, has, uh, you know, there, there are risks. And so, you know, these complementarities uh, are uh, complicated to manage and to communicate. So, and of course, I have no answer. But, you know, that's the agenda. Thank you very much, Lucrezia. Uh, we can have a very quick question uh, from Evi Papa, please. Yes, thank you. So I would like to, to say that the great moderation is over and actually we go for the new normal of big shocks. So what I wanted to ask you is that, okay, currently we're in the same boat, the shock hits the same everybody, but 
according to what the evidence uh, Shun has shown us, how would the central banks gear up for future large asymmetric shocks or future shocks in general? Would the policy that you're suggesting be enough? So th thank you very much, uh, Evie. So um, uh, I propose that we have a final round of the three panelists. We have to hurry up a bit because the, the policy panel is coming up and we have very little time. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you if you like uh, to take up Evie's question. And apart from that, please give us a very short, like one advice for our monetary policy strategy review. Thank you. I don't know who wants to start. Look, I'd like to go oh, first, Isabel. Um, uh, um, I think Evie's question is a very important one. Um, I think we had a dress rehearsal in March. Um, uh, I would just underline the point that uh, having elastic nodes that can accommodate these shocks, I think, is, ex is extremely important. Um, both the commercial bank sector uh, and, of course, the central bank um, uh, as the first and second line of defense, I think, will be very important here. Um, so um, I think it's, it's uh, building buffers. Um, uh, in a way that uh, will give an extra degree of freedom where um, uh, the financial stability, uh, liquidity injections, um, uh, although this time round, both the financial stability imperative and the monetary policy imperative pointed in the same direction, uh, that can never be uh, guaranteed. Um, so um, uh, having the right kind of buffers uh, would be very important. As for the one piece of advice, um, I think the, uh, I think what uh, history shows and I think what some of these very uh, unusual circumstances really bring to the fore is the importance of thinking about uh, uh, exchange rates as a very important part of the analysis. Um, we tend to neglect that because we, we tend to think of the uh, economy pretty much from a closed economy perspective, uh, but uh, from uh, uh, and and uh, I think um, uh, inflation and uh, and very sharp uh, currency depreciations I think do uh, uh, highlight the importance of having this external stability element as well. Thank you very much, Yun. So now the responses have to be even shorter. So Marcus, please. Yeah, thanks a lot, Evie, for a nice question. I think it's. Uh... I agree with you, there might be huge, large asymmetric shocks. If there are liquidity shocks, the ECB should take care of it with a lot of new programs they have now at their hand, at their disposal. disposal. But we also have a much broader European framework, the ECM and others, to help out on this dimension. So I think we should make use of the ECM and other policy tools we have beyond just the monetary framework. Uh, I think that's very important, in particular if it's real losses uh, which are real ad adverse shocks, which are not purely liquidity shocks. Finally, with regard to the one advice, I think what's very important for me, I think, is you would like to have a framework where inflation is worry-free, so people don't have to worry about inflation at all, so that the people can worry about other things in their lives and they don't, the class can trust. There's trust in, in the ECB and they don't worry about these things, and all the policies should be very, very much forward-looking and to avoid Potential, tra <clears throat> potential traps you might get into. Thank you very much. Uh, Marcus or Lucrezia, please, a final mm -hmm. statement. Yes, I mean, to deal with asymmetric shocks, I mean, if we are talking about the real sector, uh, I think there is, uh, you know, important work that shows that, uh, you know, fiscal policy, it's a better instrument, but that doesn't mean that, that uh, monetary policy doesn't have a role to play. And actually, you know, we in fact, you know, practice may be ahead of, uh, of theory here because, uh, you know, we are seeing in the Europe, uh, in, in the EU, a sort of coordination now, implicit coordination between uh, what the fiscal authorities are trying to do with the recovery plan and what the ECB is doing as supporting that process. And I would put there also the, the fact that uh, we are starting uh, having, uh, we are at the beginning of developing a European safe asset with this uh, uh, new fiscal, uh, with this new, uh, you know, raising debt uh, uh, by the EU. I mean, we are a long way to go, I mean, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, the beginning of something new. The market has reacted extremely positive to that. But of course, in order to, you know, to go more in that direction, you know, we also need other instruments, for example, developing the, bank, the capital market. Uh, so complementarities of, uh, of tools, again, so this is, it seems to me that is a common theme. 
Uh, and then if I have a message, uh, uh, I don't think we have the right governance uh, to deal with this mess. And uh, so I think that uh, this problem will haunt us uh, in the next years. So although this is maybe not the, the area in which the, uh, the strategy review will focus, uh, we should be aware of that. Thank you very much, Lucrezia. I would like to thank you all very much for participating, our uh, excellent panelists, all the people who asked questions, everybody who was listening, thank you very much. And now, of course, we're all very much looking forward to the next panel, and I hand over to Thierry. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Thank you to everyone for that fruitful discussion. And as Isabel announced, we look forward to seeing you for the policy panel at 545. See you soon. <laughs>